Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can talk about the Slender Man stabbing case that occurred in Waukesha, Wisconsin in 2014. Other questions here are, could I discuss the connection to shared psychotic disorder and was this crime preventable? So just a reminder that this case is based on real events and real people were involved. So I'm not diagnosing anybody here, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. Now, as I was researching material in preparation for this video, I realized it had this connection to shared psychotic disorder, also referred to as Foley Adu. So I put this video on hold and did a comprehensive review of shared psychotic disorder. That way I would be better prepared for this topic and if anybody wanted to find a detailed review of the disorder, it would be available on my channel. So I'll put a link to that video in the description for this video. So first here, I'll look at the timeline, then take a look at the mental health and personality characteristics that could have been at play in this case, and then talk about the sentence. So the perpetrators of this crime were Morgan Geyser and Anissa Weyer. The victim was named Peyton Lutner. All three girls were 12 years old when the crime took place. They went to the same school and they were friends. Geyser and Wire found this internet meme referred to as Slenderman on a website. This figure becomes important to the narrative, so I'll explain what this is. Slenderman is a fictional character that was created as an internet meme in 2009. He is typically depicted as a very tall man, about 12 feet, and a thin man with no face who wears a black suit. He has long arms, and sometimes he's depicted with tentacles. A lot of fiction has been created using this character, including narratives that feature him terrorizing and stalking people. Often these people are children. He can stretch his arms to inhuman lengths. He can cause coughing fits that are referred to as slender sickness. He can also cause paranoia and memory loss. He leads children out into the forest, never to be seen again. When he allows children to stay in their homes, he gives them a desire to kill and pushes them to become initiated into his innermost circle. So a disturbing figure that would be frightening to just about any child. After discovering Slender Man, Geyser and Wire decided that he was real and lived in Nicolay National Forest. They believed that he desired for them to kill somebody so they could prove their dedication to him, prove his existence to skeptics, protect their families, and become what they referred to as Slender Man proxies. They decided to kill Peyton Lutner. Evidently, they planned their crime for about five months. On the evening of May 30th, 2014, this was a Friday night, Geyser, Wire, and Lutner celebrated Geyser's 12th birthday by going to a roller rink and having a sleepover. Geyser and Wire planned to kill Lutner that night at 2 a.m. They were going to cover her mouth with duct tape, stab her in the neck, pull the covers over her, and run. They didn't follow through with this plan. They decided to give Lutner another day. The next morning, May 31st, they came up with a new plan to commit this murder in the bathroom at a nearby park. But eventually, they would attack Lutner in the forest during a game of hide-and-seek. Geyser had secured a kitchen knife before she left her house. Once out in the woods, Wire pushed Lutner to the ground and sat on her, believing that Geyser was going to stab her at that moment. Wire got off of Lutner. Geyser gave Wire the knife, but Wire said that she felt too squeamish and gave it back to Geyser. Geyser then turned to Wire and said, I'm not going to do this until you tell me to. Wire replied, go ballistic and crazy now. The victim was stabbed 19 times. Lutner managed to stand up but could not walk straight. Geyser and Wire led Lutner deeper into the woods, farther away from the trail. They hoped that Lutner would die and they would get to see Slender Man and know that he exists. Lutner managed to crawl out of the woods and get to a sidewalk where a man on a bicycle found her. He notified police. When they arrived, she said she was in extreme pain and said that the person who did this was her best friend, Morgan. At the hospital, she told the police about the second assailant. Lutner would survive the attack. Now, this, of course, is a horrible story, but the courage of this individual, Peyton Lutner, is incredible. For her to crawl out of the woods after being wounded so badly, almost killed. It's incredible. Geyser and Wire were arrested about five hours later. The sheriff's deputies were confused as they approached the suspects due to the age, due to them being 
so young. Geyser was handcuffed and asked why there was blood on her clothes. She said she was forced to stab her best friend. The police found the kitchen knife. Geyser and Wire indicated that they were walking to Nicolet National Forest about 200 miles away. They believed that if they walked far enough into the forest, they would find Slenderman's mansion, and then he would welcome them. At that time, Wire did express regret about the attack. Geyser said that she did not feel remorse. Geyser indicated that it was her intent to kill Lutner. In 2017, Wire accepted a plea deal where she was sentenced to 25 years to life in a state psychiatric institution. At least three years would have to be served. In 2018, Geyser was sentenced to 40 years in a psychiatric institution and was also required to serve at least three years in that secure facility. Now, there are many things that stand out as unusual about this case, not the least of which is the reason that Geyser and Wire gave for the attack, which was their devotion to this fictional character, Slenderman. Another interesting part of this case, of course, is the age and gender of the offenders. To have a crime like this committed by 12-year-old females is exceedingly rare. Now, we know they were trying to commit homicide. It's not only clear from the evidence, but Geyser admitted that she had an intent to kill, as I indicated before. So if we compare their actions to the actions of murders, we see that two years before, in 2012, 8,514 people were arrested for murder and non-negligent homicide in the United States. Of these people, only one was a female under the age of 13. Another statistic, from 1976 to 2007, girls under the age of 13 represented just 4% of all female juveniles arrested for murder and non-negligent homicide in the United States. For one girl to commit this type of crime, again, exceedingly rare. For two to conspire to commit it, it's just about unheard of. As a matter of fact, I could only think of one substantially similar case, and that was the famous case in New Zealand in 1954, Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume. That case involved isolation for the two girls and was theorized to be a case of Foley Adu, shared psychotic disorder, which I'll talk about in a few moments. So one of the questions that comes up often with this case is how could two 12-year-old girls get this way? How could people in a situation like this separate from reality and carry out such a horrible crime? Let's look at some of the mental health factors that could be at work in a situation like this. There are many interesting features in this case that may offer some insight. So I'll go through them. The two assailants appeared to be a little obsessed with fantasy and video games. They liked making up scary stories. Geyser referred to herself as a creative weirdo. They appeared to be more isolated than many of their classmates. And I think this is really the key factor, this isolation. This stands out to me more than a lot of these other elements like investing in fantasy and making up scary stories. They believed that they were going to spend the rest of their lives with Slender Man. This is really unusual. So they commit this crime, and they believe that it would be murder. They believe that Lutner was going to die. And then they walk toward the woods to spend the rest of their lives with Slender Man. On top of this, this forest was 200 miles away. So it's really reasonable, I think, to theorize that if they had made it to the woods somehow, perhaps by hitchhiking or some other way, they would have gotten lost and perhaps died. They really didn't seem to have a connection to reality. This forest is 700,000 acres, so that would be over a 1,000 square miles. So I don't know how they could have progressed far into that forest and found their way back out reliably. So that would have been particularly dangerous for them. They also thought they saw Slender Man during that walk. As they were walking along the interstate toward that forest, they thought they caught a glimpse of him. Next factor, not only did they carry out this murder attempt, they weren't shocked after they committed the crime. Like they didn't break down, they didn't lose their nerve, they just coldly went on their way and left the victim for dead. They made no attempt to render aid. They eventually made things worse by moving Lutner deeper into the woods. They planned the crime for five months and had repeated opportunities to change their minds. We see that Wire had been bullied after recently transferring to their school. She didn't share this with her parents. Geyser would later claim that she went ahead with the stabbing to keep Wire happy. She said it was hard to make friends, and she wouldn't want to lose a friend over something like this. Their belief in Slender Man made them feel special. Some of the fiction indicates that only children could see Slender Man. It's almost like they built a relationship with this figure, 
they had constructed again this alternate reality based on him and their relationship with him. When Geyser was in custody, her mother described her as floridly psychotic, indicating that she would have conversations with Slenderman, she would see unicorns, and treat the ants in her cell like they were her pets. Later, we see Geyser would describe her experiences she had before the crime. She would talk about seeing ghosts and images pop up on the wall in different colors. Eventually, Geyser would be diagnosed with early onset schizophrenia, which is extremely rare. Now, her father apparently had schizophrenia. Also, Geyser was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Weyer was diagnosed with shared delusional belief, which is essentially the same thing as shared psychotic disorder. Shared psychotic disorder isn't a current diagnostic category by itself in the DSM. Rather, it would be added as a specifier to another disorder. Her symptoms appeared to remit somewhat as she stayed separate from Geyser. So it appears that Weyer took on some of these delusions because of her exposure to Geyser. And when Geyser was no longer with her, those symptoms kind of went away to a degree. So clearly the leading theory about this case was shared psychotic disorder or folia du. This means madness shared by two, and it has other names like imposed psychosis and double insanity. So with this disorder, we typically see two people. One person is considered the primary partner, in this case, of course, conceptualized as Geyser, and one the secondary partner, which would be conceptualized as Wire. The primary partner is thought of as the one who actually has a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. The idea, again, here is that delusional thinking is imposed on the secondary partner. And the secondary partner, at least for a time, becomes delusional as well. Delusions typically have a theme. With delusional disorder, for example, we see that when the diagnosis is made, a subtype is assigned, like grandiose, jealous, or somatic. With folia du, the theme of the delusion is usually persecutory or mystical, which is interesting based on what we see in this case. The girls believe that this fictional character was real, even though he had attributes that they had never seen in real life. They wanted to prove his existence, like other people didn't believe he was real, and those people were against the girls. So we see mystical and persecutory themes here. Now there are four types of folia du, and I covered these in detail in the other video I was talking about before. But the type that seems to relate to this case is referred to as imposed psychosis. So with imposed psychosis, this is when an individual transmits delusions to someone who is mentally sound. So the secondary partner does not have any mental disorders beforehand. When the secondary partner is separated from the primary partner, the symptoms tend to remit. And of course, this really connects with the narrative we see here in this case. So was this sentence fair? People were upset on both sides in terms of this sentence. Wisconsin law allows anyone age 10 or above to be charged as an adult for a violent crime. It doesn't have to be a murder. Geyser and Wire were initially charged with first degree intentional homicide, and they could have been sentenced to 45 years in prison if found guilty. As I mentioned before, they were sentenced to a secure psychiatric facility. Some people believe that justice was served. Other people do not. With this being such a rare type of case, folia du, and we see again the early onset schizophrenia with Geyser, there's very little to compare it to in terms of trying to figure out if the sentence was just or not. It seems likely to me that both individuals could be rehabilitated. I think the sentence was a good attempt at fairness, but the minimum time that needed to be served should have been longer than three years. I think I would have been a little happier with eight years. This would have allowed plenty of time for the staff at the facility to assess them as they progressed through adolescence. Now, of course, they might spend this much time in these facilities. I'm just talking about the minimum amount of time. I think, again, it should have been longer than it was. Other questions related to this case are, was it preventable? And was the content on the internet about Slenderman to blame? Well, let's look at three factors that contributed to this crime. The Slender Man meme had a scary, dark story that happened to appeal to these girls. They liked it, fantasized about it, plotted a crime based on it, and followed through with the attack. It's really an unlikely series of events. Even still, it's probably a good idea to keep horrifying content away from children. If the content that was latched onto was not violent, it's quite conceivable that the outcome would not have been violent. Now, technology is advancing faster than parents can regulate it and control it, 
it's a tough situation. There's no easy fix in terms of trying to keep this content away from children. The next factor was the schizophrenia. Should someone have detected that disorder? Children make a lot of fanciful statements. They have rich imaginations. It can make psychosis harder to detect. And on top of that, it's so rare in children, nobody would think to look for it. The shared delusional belief is the third factor. This is not something we would expect to see. And even if somebody had asserted that they were concerned about somebody being exposed to another person who's delusional and they themselves becoming delusional, who would have believed that this could happen? So it's not just about detection or theories. It's really about could anyone have done anything even if they knew what was going on. So going back to the question, was it preventable? Some have blamed the parents, teachers, and society in general. I think it would have been very difficult to prevent. No one would have expected to see these two girls turn into violent criminals. Sometimes unfortunate things happen, and there's really nothing that can be done about it. This is an extremely rare set of circumstances. It is, however, a reminder that parents need to be diligent and keep an eye on what children are looking at and what they're doing. So it's really about supervision. And again, this is challenging. Children have a lot of energy. And as I mentioned, they have active imaginations. So there's a real difficulty here in terms of a clear course of action, right? If parents get over restrictive, that can lead to other types of problems. So it's not as simple as saying, we just need to restrict all content that could have any damaging effects. This is a tough issue that parents have to work out kind of on a case by case basis, right? They have to work it out within their families. So that's my summary of the Slender Man stabbing case, an exceedingly rare and unusual case that really causes fear, right? It makes people wonder about what could possibly happen in a variety of situations. If two 12 year old girls can commit a crime like this, who is exempt? Who is safe, right? So quite frightening. Now, I know whenever I talk about topics like this, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.